Hey everyone, welcome back to Chat Cemetery. I'm your host, Deanna Chapman, and today I am joined by Richard Chismar, and we are going to be talking about the Boogeyman books, and we'll get some Stephen King talk in there. Don't worry, I know this is a Stephen King podcast, so we have to include that, but Richard, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. I am a fan of your work that you've done with your writing, what you do with Cemetery Dance as well. And obviously, I host a Stephen King podcast, so I've read the Gwendy trilogy. So we'll start with your book that is out now, Becoming the Boogeyman. This is the second book in a series. And I have to say, I really love the way you sort of take the true crime elements of that world and incorporate it into fiction. Out of all of the true crime that you've read, what were sort of the books or writers who kind of inspired you to try this format the most? Um, pro- probably there's three different ones who, uh, who really became absorbed in the stories they were trying to tell. And one goes all the way back to uh, The Stranger Beside Me, the Anne Rule book uh, about Ted Bundy um, for a good 10 or 15 years whenever people ask me, what's the scariest book you've ever read? That was my answer because it, it just, it, it was a haunting story for me. The fact that she had actually befriend, befriended this guy and worked with him. And, and he, you know, throughout her lifetime was intertwined in her own story. Um, yeah, that stuck with me for a long time. And then uh, the the one that a lot of people, you know, responded to fairly recently was the Michelle McNamara, I'll Be Gone in the Dark. And the same thing, you know, it, where it, it became such a part of her life that it affected her emotionally and physically and, and – um, just, just the passion and, and the dedication that went into her reporting and, and, and the obsession, you know, there, there were some lines crossed where she couldn't, you know, the lines got kind of blurry. And I, and I played with that in, in becoming the boogeyman and, and actually chasing the boogeyman, too. And then uh, James Renner, who wrote the introduction for Chasing the Boogeyman, he's had several books where, you know, his own personality is splashed all over the page. And it's not in a flamboyant or a sensationalistic way. It's just, you know, how he tells a story. So th- those are the ones that, that that mainly inspired me. But I had always had the idea maybe of doing a true crime book at some point. And th- this was kind of my way of just taking a shortcut and making it all up instead of having to do the work. Yeah, true crime is always one of those things where I feel like it's a weird thing to say you're a fan of, because obviously mm-hmm. it's not about anything pleasant that has happened. Sometimes you get the outcome that you're looking for through those books, like Michelle was able to do with I'll Be Gone in the Dark. And for me personally, that book and Truman Capote's In Cold Blood are the two big true crime books that have stuck with me. And when I was reading through the Boogeyman books, you know, I kind of got that feeling that you were structuring it in a way that it tells a story. It's not just the facts of what happened. And that's what I really felt when I read In Cold Blood, because I read that in high school. And it is the one book from high school that has stuck with me (laughs) through all these years. Like I haven't gone back and reread it or anything. But it just had that power of storytelling to it, even though it was nonfiction. In a way, it almost felt like this can't be real, can it? Right. Right. It's got that haunting quality, too, you know, that, that I think a lot of the, the, the really well done. That's the thing. You know, I, I agree with you. You can't really say you're a fan of true crime. For me, it's more that those are the, some of the stories that linger the longest with me. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you, you know, especially because they have photographs and you can get visuals of just, you know, and they're not usually gory or, or sensationalistic. Like I said, they're usually just very character driven. You know, you get to see what these people actually look like. You know, it's not just up to your imagination and their houses and their bedrooms in some cases, things like that. Yeah. And I love especially in Becoming the Boogeyman, how you have incorporated images to make this fictionalized story feel more real. And obviously, you've also used yourself as a character, you have a mention of Stephen King at least a few times, and you're using these real people in the context of this fictionalized world. Where was that line for you with, okay, I'm going to use people and places I'm familiar with, but I'm going to completely make up all of the plot or is some of the plot even stuff that is 
real just from like a day-to-day life perspective? Most of it is is real. People ask me a lot with Chasing the Boogeyman, what's fact, what's fiction? And pretty much, you know, all the 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 background, um, the nostalgic coming of age part of that book where I talk about my friends and I, it's all that all really happened. You know, the uh, the names, they're they're really my friends, their names, you know, same thing with my family. I describe my house, you know, that I grew up in and the way it is. And, and so so my kind of my my shortcut answer is always, you know, it's all real until we get to the murders. Mm-hmm. And that pretty much stands true for becoming the boogeyman. I mean, the interactions, the personalities of my family members, my wife, my kids, my close friends, um, you know, the one who is kind of a combination of several people from real life. But, it, you know, I wish she was a natural person is Carly Albright. And she appears in both books. But she's that, that disappointed a lot of people after chasing. They wanted her to be real. I think some people fell in love with her or wanted to be her best friend. <laughs> and um, I had to tell people, no, she's one of the few things I, I made up. So but yeah, the, I I. You know, in order to tell the story the way I wanted to tell it, I kind of had to really cross all those lines and tell some secrets and and day to day. And I didn't hold back. You know, some of the things I wrote in Chasing about my family, you know, really personal stuff and, you know, memories I'd never written about until that book. But I didn't feel like I could tell the story unless I did that. I didn't feel like I could allow the reader to really get to know me and my hometown and my family and friends unless I took that jump. So I continued, you know, and did that with uh, Becoming the Boogeyman, too. So is it safe to say that this has been a pretty therapeutic process for you as well, then just being able to finally write about those things you mentioned that you hadn't written about before and sort of just go back through your history, reliving some of those memories? Yeah, you know, I don't know if it was therapeutic because I, I'll tell you, it was, you know, and I said this a lot back when I was doing press with Chasing the Boogeyman, but, you know, like my parents, they had been gone for over a decade, both of them. So while I was writing that book, it was wonderful because they were alive. They were right there in front of me. Um, my mom was cooking dinner. You know, I was way too old to be there, you know, graduated from college and just came home. But that's, you know, the way it worked out for nine months. So it was just a really interesting dynamic. But yeah, I mean, you know, therapeutic, I can see it being that for some people. Those memories were all, for the most part, were stories that my friends and I had talked about. You know, I'm, I'm still friends with all the guys I grew up with. Quite a few of them live out of state. So when we get together, those are kind of memories that we, we went over time and time again and laughed and just like old friends do. But some of the inner thoughts, some of the inner, the moment where I'm coming home from sledding and chasing the boogeyman and I'm, I, it's dusk and there's the hush of the snowfall and I see the glow of the lights in my house up the street. And I kind of have that epiphany where, you know, nothing's ever going to be the same again. You know, in a couple of years, we're all going to spread out and some of us are going to come back and all of that. You know, that's something I'd never written about. It, it, I always tell people that and the moment where I saw my father down the stairs at like 4.30 a.m. and he's getting ready for work. And I'm like, this is what it means to be a, a grown up and take care of your family. And, it, it, you know, um, so many people responded to those, to those little moments, which made me feel like I made the right decisions. But for me, they were the uh, deer scene in Stephen King's Stand By Me, okay. where he says he, he saw that deer at, at sunrise on the train tracks, and I've never spoken of it until now. And so I had a lot of those. And those were the things I kind of had. I made that decision to just go all in and put them in there. And same thing with the second book, several things in order to make the story work as well as it could. Yeah, that brings me to my next question. Was it hard to sort of fit in this partially fictionalized world with all of these true things that did happen? Because obviously in the real sequence of events, there was no murder. So you had to sort of pick your places to fit that into the story. Was that something that was a challenge for you? Or did you find it sort of all fell in line as you were going back and, you know, writing about these memories again? Yeah, it kind of fell in line. I mean, part of it was the uh, setup of the story is just, uh, you know, it's the I, it's a very old fashioned story. It's a campfire mm-hmm. story is what I always tell people the boogeyman books are there. You know, I don't break any new ground with plotting. It's it's a boogeyman story about, uh, you know, the bad guy who comes to town and it's a small town everyone knows each other but yet there's secrets and so it's been it's been done before so because of that particular framework i felt like the murders really f- just fell into place you know we've all seen those movies like that um, and read the books like that on the other hand with chasing it was based on something called the phantom fondler a guy who was breaking into homes at the time and touching sleeping women um, he, he would touch their hair their legs and then when they woke up he would take off 
Um, and I remember how that f- I, I remember, you know, what it felt like to live in Edgewood while that was happening back in the 80s. There was fear. People did start locking their doors and rumors started going around. And there were rumors that people were getting guns and things like that. What I didn't remember, you, you know, if someone had asked me before I started chasing the boogeyman, you know, Phantom Fondler, it really happened. Yes. How many times did it happen? I, I think I, my, my answer probably would have been six or seven times. Mm-hmm. When I went back and did research, I was shocked to find that it had happened like 25 or 30 times. So no wonder Edgewood was kind of on the on edge. So I did have that particular plot point right there in place. And, and that's kind of where I came up with the story is I, I kind of said, OK, well, people who do that, they usually escalate into either more than just touching or violence, that kind of thing. So, you know, the Edgewood's boogeyman really w- did grow out of the Phantom Fondler and, and what, w- what would happen if he did more. So, yeah, it, it, was, it was both books. You know, I hate to say it because writing's a tough gig. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like, you know, you, no matter how quick you are, no matter how clean you are, whatever, you have to work at it. And I, and I do multiple and multiple drafts, so it definitely is work. But the two Boogeyman books came fairly easily. You know, things kind of just fell into place. When you were researching, you know, you mentioned finding out that those attacks had been happening 20 plus times, not the single digits that you thought. Were there any other things that you discovered through your research? Because obviously with your personal memories, memory is a funny thing and sometimes details are a little fuzzy, but you probably can't go back and research these memories with your friends, but something like the Phantom Fondler you could. Was there anything else you found that sort of just surprised you and you were like, oh, hey, I was a little off on this too. You know, what Edgewood is known for is being next to Edgewood Arsenal, which is an outgrowth of Aberdeen Proving Ground. And it's where they did, you know, you should Google it because if you're a Stephen King fan, you'd find it interesting. I mean, it's like it's like real life X-Files stuff. Okay. And I, you know, I used to fish on post all the time. It's where my summer job was, but it's behind gates. There's armed guards. You have to, you know, my father was Air Force retired and he worked on the Proving Ground. So we had little stickers on the car that allowed us to go through. If you don't have one of those little stickers, they stop you, they take your license, they write it down, you know, you know, they want to know where you're going. Yeah, It's an interesting place and tons of rumors. It's just spooky, empty warehouses, warehouses that are often classified areas where once you get in the gate, you really can't go there unless you get through another gate with guards. And this time they are actually holding their guns and they're shining mirrors under your cars and your trucks. And I only know about those areas because I worked there. Yeah. Um, as a teenager, I did landscape, you know, I, I weed eat it and, and mowed lawns. So, um, yeah, a lot of a lot of weird stuff. And it's very it's it's widely known for being where they did all the chemical we- weapons testing for uh, like Vietnam and, okay. and the world too. So there's a lot of weird stuff there. I, I discovered some neat stuff doing research on that, but I, I realized very quickly I had to leave that kind of in the background because it was a whole, it's a whole nother book. It really yeah. is. <laughs> that sounds like a whole other rabbit hole that you could go down for hundreds of pages, just that alone. So I, I definitely understand that. And like you said, for myself, Google it, listeners, Google it too, have, have at it, go down that rabbit hole. What I did was just, I took like even in the history of the town that I researched, I would have four things that were interesting that had happened there. Like the Confederates burned this bridge. They really did in, in the Civil War on their way, you know, north or actually on their way retreating south. And then I would sprinkle in something like the uh, – and there really is a Denby town, which ta- which is on the outskirts of Edgewood where the African-American population lived at a certain time. But they didn't have a jazz club that burned down. I stole that directly from Stephen King and it. And I sprinkled things like that throughout out just because I was having fun and trying to make the story a little more interesting. Yeah. And speaking of King, we obviously talked about your true crime influences, but having worked with him now, is there a different way in which he has influenced your work since you've been able to co-write with him? Uh, For sure. I know I'm like, so not a stylist, you know, when, when people talk about someone with, you know, a lush style or, uh, you know, um, just a, a more intricate stylistic approach, you know, I'm thinking of people like uh, Peter Straub and those guys, um, you know, Thomas Ligotti. I'm very much a storyteller. Just get the words down. And, and often I'm very lean and, and fast and it's all about that narrative drive. One of the things that's that working with Steve, I really learned was that it's OK every once in a while to take my time. 
and to kind of go on these offshoots and take these side roads. And, and he really gave me the confidence that, hey, Rich, if you do that right, you're not going to lose the reader. They're going to be they're going to be interested in it. There might be that critic who's like, yeah, he could have told this story in 300 pages instead of four, which Steve gets all the time. <laughs> but you're also going to get all those people who Steve has also who talk about how the minor characters in Salem's Lot were absolutely what made that town come to life for them and how they remember the histories of a lot of these guys, like the the milk guy who left the milk bottles on the porch. And and, you know, how in every Stephen King novel, there's that group of people. So he, yeah, he gave me the confidence to kind of every once in a while, just take those side roads and not be so, so much of a hurry to connect the dots of, of the main story. And, and I definitely, you know, put that to use in the boogeyman books. I have to admit, I am a little guilty of saying that sometimes books are a little too long, especially when it comes to yeah. King. To be fair, I read all of them within like a three year time period for this podcast. So it, it was a lot. But like you were saying, one of my favorite things is the world building that he's able to do. And you have to have those smaller characters that you hone in on every once in a while in order to make that world feel complete. It can't just be about two or three characters. Like if the Dark Tower only focused on Roland, Jake, Eddie, and Susanna the entire time, that would play completely different than when he would go off on these tangents, like you were saying, about the characters and either things from their past or just what they've gone through in general. And with especially becoming the boogeyman. I think you can really see that in this one in particular, just because of the fact that you're sort of building up Edgewood even more. Because, you know, in chasing, like you said, it was more of a coming of age thing. And in becoming, you really get to expand on that. Because when you're a kid, your circles can be pretty small, and you're not really paying attention to what all of the adults are doing. And then once you're an adult, you're like, oh, hey, the world is a lot bigger than me and my five friends or (laughs) whatever. Right. Yeah. And and I mean, you make a great point because within the two books, I'm kind of looking at Edgewood through the lenses of three different glasses. You know, one where as I'm a kid, I'm still out there, you know, throwing crab apples at cars and and playing, you know, wiffle ball and football with my friends and, and, and all of that. And then in that same book, the bulk of it, I'm a 22 year old or a 21 year old. I don't remember where the town is certainly different. But, you know, like I said, that that dynamic is introduced where I'm right back in my old bedroom that I grew up in. And, and there's a line early on that says, I'm, you know, I kind of look out the window and I can see the ghosts of my childhood. So I'm looking at it with, with you know, improved uh, maturity, but only to a certain point because I'm still just kind of on that cusp of adulthood. Yeah. And then becoming, I'm an old guy, you know, I'm in my 50s like I am right now. And I see the town in a completely different way. But not only that, the town's changed. So, yeah. I, and, and that's, I hope that comes across to the reader. It's still, you know, this in the second book, it's still very much kind of a love letter to my hometown. But things aren't the way they used to be. Um, so I don't take it easy on it. Yeah. And that's important to show because even with something like it, you have the two very different time periods and you see how things have shifted, not only for the characters, but Derry itself. And I think you have accomplished the same with Edgewood. Obviously, you're not going back and forth chapter by chapter like it, but even just between the two books, it's very clear It's like you have grown, the town has grown, and that is how it is for a lot of places. Obviously, when you have really, really small towns, like, you know, you're 15 people in a tiny little town, that might be a little different. But even some smaller towns in general, just over the years have grown because of how much the population has grown. And I think it's important to show in a story like this, how that has changed things. My parents a few years ago moved to not necessarily the middle of nowhere, Colorado, but it's east of Colorado Springs. And there weren't as many houses when they moved there, but they pretty much immediately started building up more. So there's like a whole Mm -hmm. new track of homes. And even just a few years can really have a big impact 
on a town itself. And it oh, just yeah. brings in different people. And I think it's great to see that growth. But to shift gears a little bit, if you don't mind, I would love to talk about the Gwendy's trilogy. Of course, I'd love to. So for Gwendy, obviously, you co-wrote the first one with Stephen King. Solo wrote the second one, co-wrote the third one. What was the process like for that? Because I imagine co-writing is a much different experience than just being able to run with something on your own. So what was the shift that you had to make as a writer between each of those books because of the fact that, you know, you had this solo book sandwiched in between writing with Stephen King? Well, what's interesting is I didn't know it was going to be a solo book at the time, but I'll start at the beginning. I mean, Gwenny's Button Box was just, you know, Steve had maybe 25 pages, maybe 30. And we were just emailing back and forth one day and, and the subject somehow got on collaborations. And he mentioned he had a story he had never finished. And, you know, one of the perks of being, you know, good friends with Steve is sometimes I get to see things in advance. Like, you know, I read, I read Holly in manuscript like two years ago, uh, which is awesome. But now, you know, the Holly's release day comes out in September and everyone's so excited. And I'm like, I still go to Target and buy my copy because I want to, you know, I, I want to keep the tradition alive. Yeah. But, you know, I'm looking at it and I'm like, I've already read you. <laughs> Damn it. You know? But that's one of the perks. And, and so I actually said to him, I said, well, if you ever want to send it over, I'd like to read it. Didn't think about it the rest of the day. The next morning it showed up and, you know, it didn't say, hey, hope you enjoy it. Or, you know, you can see it. it, it you know, I couldn't finish it because it stinks or anything like that. He just said, do whatever you want with it. <laughs> and I was like, I wrote him back. I said, what do you mean? I said, you want me to finish it? And he's like, if you think you can. And I, you know, I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. So that's it, completely a happy accident. You know, spent that weekend thinking, what the hell have I gotten myself into? <laughs> you know, it, honestly, fear really quickly overtook excitement. And then the next week when I sat, sat down to write, it, it kind of all came to a head. And I just, you know, it, reading the story in a parking lot, with, you know, waiting for my son's hockey game to finish, I uh, our practice, right in the first sentence, you read Castle Rock. So it was intimidating. But like I said, but when I finally started, writing, I kind of just disappeared. And I wrote a big chunk, sent it to him. He wrote a chunk, sent it back. I wrote a chunk. And my original ending was too dark for Steve, which people always laugh about. <laughs> and thank God, you know, he, he kind of went in and, and massaged it around. And then I added a little bit. The wonderful thing about it is, is you know, and he said it back then. He said, Gwendy deserves better than what I did to her. So uh, there would be no sequels if, if my ending had stood. So that's the cool thing. But um so that was the first one. The second one was my idea. I dreamt a great deal of it. And I woke up and I sent him an email really early, which I don't usually do because um, I'm not awake. But uh, he wrote back immediately and he said, this is a brilliant idea. You've got to write it. No, he said, I'll be busy for a while with Holly because I don't remember what book he was writing that had Holly in it. But this was, you know, years ago. And he said, but you need to write it. So I took that as, Rich, you need to write the first draft because I'm too busy I'll come back and, and jump on as your collaborator when you're done. But that's not what he meant. So I didn't find that out till I sent him the manuscript and said, all right, Steve, your turn. Make me look good. He read it and wrote back and said, you already look pretty good. If you want, I'll give you an edit. But this is all you. And and to say I was shocked is is the understatement of the, the decade. I, you know, all the after fears just rushed in because I and I told him, I said, Steve, I never would have resurrected Castle Rock in this book. You know, Castle Rock was gone after Needful Things. And I kind of brought it back and talked about the Tam Square and the statue that they erected when they rebuilt the town. I never would have done all that. Yeah. It's fun to play in Stephen King's sandbox with his mythology, but I wouldn't have made such a big move like that. But you know what? It worked out. And then the third book, he uh, it was his idea. He, he I started getting these texts rapid fire. And, you know, within a half an hour, we had decided we'd put aside a couple months. He wanted to make it a complete novel. And, and on that book, we just traded 50 page sections back and forth and, you know, rewrote each other. We never talked about where the story was going. We just trusted each other. And that was a lot of fun. No outlining. I mean, at all. I remember on day one, he said, strap in because <laughs> we're going. Um so yeah, just just yeah, a, a crazy amount of fun and ridiculous. I I've been doing a bunch of signings and someone asked me every night, "Can you describe what it's like?" You know, the experience and I just say, "Well, considering I'm a constant reader like you, you know, everyone in the audience, and I walked around my town growing up with Stephen King paperbacks and the biggest Stephen King fan in the world." Uh, so the the idea that I got to write with him 
you know, a, a trilogy is just ridiculous. So that's my word I always say. It's, it's ridiculous, but it's been a wonderful experience. Yeah, it sounds like one of those things that you never really think is going to happen. And it sounds like it was a little chaotic when it was happening, just because you were like, oh, I didn't realize this was happening this way for each of the at least first two books. And I think that's great, though, because it all started just because you happened to ask him a question. And obviously, not everyone is friends with Stephen King. So not everyone who is a writer necessarily, too, is going to have the chance to do that. But with the first one being more of a novella length, you mentioned you thought that was going to be like a one and done thing. Oh, we both did. Yeah. I mean, both Steve and I, you know, because they asked the question after when we were doing press for that. Mm -hmm. And Steve's answer was always, you know, there are no plans to do another. My answer was always, no, there's no plans. If But if he changes his mind and wants to, I'd love to. <laughs> yeah, because typically with King's novellas in particular, they're sort of just these single stories that are obviously longer than short stories, but not quite as expanded upon as, you know, his novels. And there's something just great about his novellas. And sometimes they leave you wanting more. And it seems like that was the case with Wendy's. And, you know, for me, I noticed like how attached he is to Holly. You know, you brought mm -hmm. Holly up and obviously Holly appearing in the Bill Hodges trilogy and then getting a novella as well. And now a full novel. It feels like that's almost what happened with Wendy. It's like you guys went in and you did this one novella and then you were like, oh, wait, we have more ideas for this character. And then you were able to just sort of add on. Was that kind of how that transpired, really? It was just like, oh, I have this other idea, you know, and then he let you run with it. And then it was like, OK, how about one more? Yeah, well, that's the thing. I mean, those transitions were so kind of unexpected in both times, because, again, you know, people have often said, you know, hey, Rich, from a from a publishing standpoint, how, how have you been able to work with him for, you know, 35 years and and, you know, form that long term relationship? And, and my answer is always I don't really know, but I do know this. There's never a sense of entitlement from me. I never expect anything. Um for a lot of years, when I would ask, I would always make it really clear, hey, there's no reason for you to do another book mm -hmm. with us. You know, you've done plenty. But if you want, we're here and I'd love to do this. Um, I tell people all the time back in the day, you know, he would say no to things all the time. So it wasn't like I had some secret, you know, yeah. magic wand that I waved. But I think just being a, a decent human being and, and like I said, no sense of entitlement and being polite and all those things keyed into that, you know, a beginning relationship. Um, and then... I stopped asking because, you know, he knows what I do. So he knows if I, you know, it, and that's what would happen. He would, you know, every once in a while he'd send me something and say, hey, you want to publish this? Um, so I don't ask him, you know, about that stuff anymore. And I felt the same way about like and the possibility of a sequel. When I sent him that email and plenty of people, I can understand why they wouldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. I had no intentions of there being a second book. I just I remember writing the email and I said, hey, I think I know what gwendy has been doing since the end of the first book. I said, she got, in a surprise, she got elected to Congress. And it had nothing to do with the, the current climate of politics that's going on in the world right now. It was just, well, it, it, the only thing it had to do with that is that I was watching CNN the night before, I just flipping channels, and I stopped and I watched like a five-minute story on the diversity of the, of the new Congress that had, been re, that had been elected. And I'm not a real political mm -hmm. guy. But it did strike me that there was there was from, you know, different nationalities, age groups, you know, a lot of females. Um, and it was kind of I thought, well, that's kind of cool. And I went to sleep with that somewhere in the back of my head. So I did. I woke up and I thought, Gwendy's a freaking, you know, congresswoman. And the button box comes back. And that's interesting because when it came back originally, I mean, when it got to her originally, she was a little girl. Then she was a high school student. Then she was a college student. So her range of power, even though it was enormous because of the box, mm -hmm. just on the basis of who she was in the world, it was pretty limited still. You know, there was only certain things she could, you know, in her own mind, think to use it for. But if she's a congresswoman, she's privy to all this classified, you know, information and she knows what's going on 
in the world and within this country. So I thought that'd be really interesting. And Steve, who is political, as you know, he loved it. And so, yeah, I never I, I, I honestly was not pitching it to be a sequel. I just said, hey, I know what Wendy's been doing. And that, that's why he said, you have to write it. And then with the third one, again, I had no clue. I remember it was a Sunday evening and I started getting texts. And if I get him rapid fire, it's usually because he's excited about something he's just watched, a movie, or it's sports. It's baseball or football. And uh, instead, he was talking about Gwendy and he was talking about this space station and all this. And I still remember I asked him very bluntly. I said, Steve, you going to write this one with me or what? Are you just throwing the idea out? And he's like, no, I think we should write it. I think it should be a novel. You know, can you block some time? And we got we got into it right away. And I remember, you know, when we were done, I turned to my wife and I was like, well, this is awesome. (laughs) And I said, but does it have to be on a damn space station? Because I don't you know, I don't know anything about space. there, There was like a split second where I was like, is he is he pulling my leg? But he wasn't. And he had the idea of, you know, of her brain, you know, kind of of going away from her. And, and I just loved it. As we got into the writing, he wrote the, the beginning and um, the beginning section. And I picked up from there. And like I said, no planning, just playing ping pong back and forth with the manuscript. And and he introduced so much of the Dark Tower stuff, which I felt really honored that he was you know, kind of inviting me along for the ride. I'm the one who took the story back to Derry because it's my favorite mm-hmm. book. And I thought, you know what? This is a once in a lifetime chance. I want to break away from Castle Rock a little bit, the story down on Earth. And Derry's not that far. So that's what we're going to do. And I remember when I sent him my 50 page chunk, I was like, oh, God, he's going to, you know, he's going to think you've lost your mind. And instead, he loved it and he made it better really embrace the whole idea of dairy. So yeah, that's, that's, that's how they came about. And there really was no, uh, I had no hint that he thought about a third. I'm sure he had no hint that I was going to dream about a second. (laughs) And in his introduction to Magic Feather, he says, he says that reading my manuscript, he fell in love with Gwendy all over again. So you're right about as far as he, he does feel very strongly, to, you know, connected to Holly and, and, and to a lesser extent, Gwendy. And the only thing that would be cooler is seeing them both in the same story, which is always in the back of my head. I would really, Holly and Gwendy would really kick ass together. Sounds like we might have another book or novella brewing here, but... Oh, that'd be cool. It's amazing because that email that you sent him after the novella easily could have just been something that stayed between you two. Because, you know, I, I'm not someone who writes, but I work on a lot of podcasts. You know, I do a lot of sort of different type of creation. And I always bounce ideas off of people. And I want to say 98% of the time, they're ideas that just never go anywhere. It's, it's just like, hey, I was thinking about this thing. And then that's kind of the end of it. And that email easily could have been something like that. So it's great that he was like, you know what, I like this, I'll let you run with it, even though it maybe wasn't clear that you were running with it solo at the time. But I imagine that was something, you know, like you said, you just weren't expecting you were just like, Oh, hey, I've been thinking about this thing. And I think that should be a lesson for other creators and writers, obviously, not everyone should go pitch things to Stephen King. Not all of us have his email or his phone number, right? But if you have friends who also create things that you truly enjoy and really like, just toss ideas around with them and you never know what might happen. The really interesting thing there is Steve and I rarely talk about writing. People have said, you know, do you guys talk about the nuts and the bolts? Never. Do you guys talk? I mean, literally the only time is when he edited me. Yeah. You know, and I kept the manuscript to give to my kids one day because there's not that many marks, you know, things scribbled on there, but there's enough and they're really cool and insightful and funny um, and helpful. But we don't talk about writing. We talk about sports. We talk about our families. We talk about our dogs. We talk about books that other people wrote. We talk about movies a lot. And, you know, we talked about, you know, just nonsense pop culture stuff sometimes. And that's that's really it. We don't you know, we don't talk business and we don't talk our our own writing like like he might tell me he might mention if he's having a tough time. He might say, yeah, you know, maybe maybe tomorrow, Rich, in an answer to something else, you know, this book's kicking my ass, something like that. But it's not there. So it's just that day we happen to be talking about collaborations and, so, and, you know, if I think about back about it, it's crazy because, like you said, it, it was a throwaway comment that could have went nowhere. 
and it wasn't intended to go anywhere. Yeah. Um, because that's the that's the furthest thing. People have said, well, did you ever think about writing with them? And I'm like, no. I thought about publishing them because of my publishing company. And that was a dream come true. Did you ever think about becoming good friends with them? No, not really. You know, that was kind of outside the, the dream, you know, cycle there. And then did you ever think about writing with them? Absolutely never. Not once. I would never do it. If I ever thought it, I would have felt so foolish. Like, oh, yeah. To the point where I never even asked him, hey, Steve, you know, why 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 did you decide to trust me with that? And it wasn't until we were doing an interview, a bonus interview for the audio version of Button Box. Okay. And the woman who interviewed us asked, Steve, you know, why did you decide to, to work with Rich? And I was like, I, I don't know if it made the final tape or not, but I was like, yeah, Steve, why the hell did you pick me? It might have made the, the tape. But and essentially he said, I had just read a long December, a collection from me. And he said, so many of your stories are set in small towns with everyday people, the kind of guys who like, you know, pick up something at Rite Aid and then they meet their mom over at Cracker Barrel for dinner. And I just thought if anyone could finish Gwendy, you could. And I just thought, wow, you know, number one, what a great compliment. But also how fortunate I was that at the time he had just finished that book. So it was kind of in front of, you know, his brain. But yeah, ridiculous. That's the word I'll continue to use. Yeah. It's also one of those things where with a person like Stephen King, you can never really go into things just like, oh, I want to write with him one day. So I'm going to, you know, just make this connection. Instead, it was like, you had a friendship that had built up over decades, you had published his books and, you know, Cemetery Dance for anyone who might not know, which I feel like most listeners of this podcast know, but you've done a lot of special editions in particular. So, you know, there's a little more work that goes into making sure everything is set for those, you know, it's not this massive run that, you know, someone like Simon and Schuster is doing, because you're creating these things on a much more limited scale. So, you know, it's understandable that you would have to have that sort of relationship with him to get those things out to his fans, because obviously, too, it's going to be some of his biggest fans who are buying these things from Cemetery Dance. And like you said, you never thought about even asking him to collaborate with him. And I think that is sort of not necessarily the best example of networking, because networking isn't what you were doing, but of just fostering a relationship over time. And you can't go into something like that thinking, oh, hey, this person is an insanely famous writer. I will eventually get something out of this. You just can't think like that. And it's more often than not when you don't, when things like this do end up happening. And I think that's just, you know, a great example of that in particular. Yeah. To put it as bluntly as as possible, you're like, no one's going to write Steve a a letter, no matter how heartfelt, no matter how well crafted and get him to say, yes, I'll collaborate with you. There's going to have to be that deep seated reason why he he takes that leap, number one. And number two, it's going to have to come entirely from him. And that's something I had a lot of, like I said, people have often asked me from a publishing standpoint, how do you get them to say yes to stories or a book or this? Because they've been trying for years. And my response has always been, I just ask. And he says no plenty of times. And then I got to a point where I stopped asking. But for instance, Chattery Teeth, the story that he sent me back in 1991 for the magazine for Cemetery Dance, I had sent him every issue of the magazine and it appeared in issue 14. So when I got it, it was probably, you know, at the time issue 13 was out. Um, But from the very beginning, issue one, I always sent up a copy of the magazine. Every time we published a book, I sent it up to Bangor. And I'm sure there were always letters that accompanied it that said, hey, you're a huge influence. You know, I owe all this to you. If you ever want to, you know, send us something, we would welcome into open arms, blah, 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 blah. And I'm sure I probably tacked on that PS that said, I absolutely don't expect it, but would love it. You know, that kind of thing. Just to let them know I'm sane. Because there, believe it or not, there are people who absolutely will write him and say, I've been publishing for 10 years. It's time. I've worked with everybody except you. And it's just unbelievable some of the how some people think. So, um, But he sent Chattery Teeth uh, completely unsolicited through his agent. And that's why it actually sat in my slush pile for over a month. I didn't even know it was there because I didn't at the time. I didn't know who Chuck Varell was. So I had an envelope that said Chuck Varell, New York, New York. And it, it could have been anyone. So it, it, it sat in my closet with the doors that had been taken off in a, in a slush pile that was about three feet high. And 
I think five weeks later, I got a postcard from Chuck. And this time on the postcard, he said, hey, I, I'm Stephen King's agent, and um, we sent you the story and, and wonder if you had a chance to look at it because Steve would really like to see it in some interior dance. And I still remember running back to my closet and just throwing manuscripts over my shoulder until I got it. And I was like, oh, my God. And then the same thing, the very first book we published, I still have – the uh, manuscript and and the cover letter and it came from Marsha, um, who was his assistant and it just said Steve asked me to send you this manuscript and see if you would like it and would want to publish it as a limited edition. So again, it, it wasn't a result of some big fancy proposal or some uh, you know elegantly designed you know video you know proposal or something like that. It was just I was just putting in the work and. Uh, I think over the first you know decade, he, he saw that I was doing these things for the right reasons. And he, and he said, yeah, I want to support this guy. So yeah, it's just interesting because it's the furthest thing from networking. It really is just kind of doing my job and going off um, and, and focusing on that and, and hopefully doing a good enough job that people notice. Yeah, especially with something like Cemetery Dance. It's like you didn't start that with the intention of, hey, I would like to publish a Stephen King story. You started that with the intent of, hey, this is a thing I really want to do and I really like this genre and let's just put out, you know, the best magazine that we can. And obviously he was able to see that. And with a little nudge from Chuck's follow up postcard, you know, you were able to get one of his stories published. But Richard, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Are there any final words you'd like to give about becoming the boogeyman before we wrap up here? Uh, not really. I mean, I appreciate the the talk and I had fun doing it. And uh, I always like talking about Steve. People are always a little afraid. They're like, oh, you get tired of talking about him. I'm like, no, <laughs> Can, you know, he's such an influence. He's such a great guy, you know. And so and I know a lot of fans kind of, you know, and I'm very protective. I'm not going to I'm not going to tell Steve about our secrets and, you know, the stuff in our conversations have gone off in left field. And But, yeah, I'm just always happy to let people know that he's that absolutely as smart and as funny and as generous and all that as he comes across on Twitter and and when those, inter- you know, the interviews you see, he's just a big kid who, who's really enjoying uh, life. And thank God he still wakes up every day and writes. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Richard. No, thank you.